I'd like to talk with you this evening about being hungry. Somebody said, I'm hungry. <laughs> it is something I'd like to share some ideas and thoughts with you. I'm not asking that you believe anything that I say. I'm not asking that you agree with me. I'm merely asking that you stand on and in the conversation that we'll share with you this evening. And if there's something that I say that can fit and work for you, I say use it. If not, discard it and let it be. Is that all right? Yeah. Say, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Very good. All right. <laughs> One of the things I have realized, and many of us have, that if you want something out of life, if you want to change yourself, if you want to acquire something, if there's some goal that you want to reach, that is really not easy as some people will make us feel. That living your dream, changing your behaviors, overcoming negative habits, it's challenging. It's hard. That living alone is just very difficult. And once we begin to come to grips with the fact that living is difficult, Life is very challenging. I heard a song once by a guy named Dipples called, If it ain't one thing, it's another. <laughs> I say to you, if it ain't one thing, it's 12 others. <laughs> Always something. You will never, ever have a problem-free moment in life. Somebody said, and I like this, that you either in a problem or just left one or headed toward one. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody found that to be so? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's always something. So how do we begin to nurture that hunger? What are the characteristics or the qualities of people that are hungry? What will it take for me to get some of the things that I want? And being hungry for those things. Number one, you've got to work on yourself. It's very important that you engage in an ongoing process to develop you. Spend more time on yourself than what you've been spending. It's very important. You owe that to yourself. I was reading a book by Og Mandino called The University of Success. Read one line. Gave me a chill. I didn't have to read anything else in the book. He said, many of us never realize our greatness because we become sidetracked by secondary activity. We spread ourselves too thin. Don't know how to say no. And we find ourselves doing all kinds of things and never ever have time to do those things that we need to do to work on ourselves. And then there goes a second, there goes another second, there goes another second, and we can't stop and hold time. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're behind on your dreams and your bills. <laughs> so decide that you're gonna take some time to work on you, that you deserve that from yourself, that your life deserves some prime time because you are creating your own production. As Michael Todd would say, you are the star of your show, you are the director, you're writing the script and you will determine whether your life is a smash office hit or flop. You determine that. Working on yourself, talking to yourself, that's so very important. Overcoming the negative conversation, that inner dialogue that's going on all the time, all the time, even when you don't want it to be there. You can't stop yourself right now from thinking. You can't do it. It's going on. And so learning how to empower yourself, part of doing that is standing up to yourself. You've got to stand up inside yourself sometimes and say, shut up. <laughs> You've got to do this. I was going to give a presentation, and this voice inside of me saying, you can't do this, you don't have everything it takes. I shut up! <laughs> yeah, I'm behind on my bills and you're telling me what I can't do. <laughs> I have got to do it. <laughs> You'll get scared sometimes. Your mind will go blank on you. Some people you will allow to unnerve you. And you wonder, what's wrong with me? I'm not crazy. That's why you've got to learn to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to stand up inside yourself. Working on yourself, watching that inner dialogue, it will determine the quality of your life. I don't believe this, I know this. I've had a challenge of losing weight. I'm walking through the airport, this voice say, why don't you have some M&M peanuts? No!
Well, just one. <laughs> then after you eat that, you might as well have a snicker now, you sucker. <laughs> I mean, it's challenging. My mother fixed the kind of sweet potato pie you can't eat with your shoes on. <laughs> Have to take your shoes off so you can wiggle your toes. It sticks on my fingers. It says, eat it. One little bite won't hurt. That voice, constantly. Little demons from Colonel Sanders driving my car in there. <laughs> I had to say, no, 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 no. I'll die it tomorrow. <laughs> I saw a skinny man get hit by a truck. <laughs> had had a little bit more weight, he might have lived. You know? <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you know that. That voice is awesome. So you have got to stand up to that voice. When you're working on something you want to achieve, you have got to stand up to that voice. You've got to sell yourself every day on your abilities, on what you're doing, on the goal that you want to reach. You've got to sell yourself every day, every day, every day. According to your level of belief, it will manifest itself in what you're doing. Whatever we have right now, whatever we're demonstrating in our lives is a result of what we believe subconsciously that we deserve. And part of increasing that belief level is that you have got to convince yourself every day. You've got to sell yourself. I, I do a lot of training for many corporations and I conduct sales seminars and I've heard all kind of guys doing techniques and training um, people techniques of how to close sales and how to work with and, and begin to control the, the sale and how to ask for the close. Let me share something with you. You can learn all the techniques in the world. If you don't believe in yourself, it won't happen for you. I learn all of it. So that's why I do a training called Focus on the Seller. You've got to focus on you. And as you convince you, as you sell yourself every day, every day, every day, you will begin to see a difference in the things that you're doing. Selling yourself on your ability to perform a job, to achieve a certain objective, telling yourself every day, here I go again, and I got what it takes. This is my day and nothing out here is going to stop me. And when you go out there, life say, come over here. <laughs> say it again. Well, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> that brings me to the next thing. It takes courage to act. Part of being hungry when you've been defeated, it takes courage to start over again. I used to do door-to-door -door sales and I was working with another friend of mine, and door-to-door -door sales, I mean, it's punishing. It's cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> and I was a little boy, knocking on the door, hello, would you like to buy a nice working television set, no money down? No! Bam! They slammed the door in your face. And the friend of mine that was working with me, they slammed the door in his face, and I looked back, and he was going to the car. He said, I can't do this. And he sat down in the car, and he said, you go ahead, I'll be here when you get back. Now he had a mother and father to take care of him. My mother was ill, I am adopted. I was hungry. I had to go on. I learned something about myself. That when you step into your fear, somebody said, it was Winston Churchill, he said that courage is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> When you step into your fears and continue to push yourself to go on, something happens for you. It will enable you to transcend yourself. I went to the next door. You like to buy a nice work and tell, no, bam. Went to the next door, no, bam. After a while, I no longer took it personal. <laughs> <laughs> and I begin to play a game. I say, well, I know there's a yes out here somewhere, and I'm going to keep on until I find it. And I'm not going home until I do. And I continue to knock on doors. And then somebody eventually would say yes. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> and I would go in there and I would get the sale. When you, when you have something you want to do, 
If you don't develop the courage to do that which has been given you to do, and you spend a lot of time going around trying to convince other people or trying to get their approval, what will happen is that you will lose your nerve and other people will convince you that what you're doing doesn't have any value and you'll give up on your dream. It's an interesting thing about life I've also found that if you don't have the courage to act, sometimes and particularly if you have something special to do, life will move on you. I'd, if, 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 if it were not for life, I would still be a disc jockey. I didn't just leave voluntarily to go to the state legislature. I was fired. <laughs> I was working on a job and I came home one day. I was married at the time and I told my former wife, I said, that guy Bert I work for is stupid. She said, if he's so stupid, why does he sign you a paycheck? <laughs> now you see why I divorced her, right? <laughs> I couldn't stand her. <laughs> that night, I could not sleep well. Here was a guy that was controlling my life. I was going through all kinds of changes because this man controlled my paycheck. And it was Carlisle who said, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. And we know scripture that says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the truth that I had to come to grips with, that I wasn't in charge of my destiny. The truth was that I wasn't giving all that I had. The truth was that there are some things that I wanted to do, but I didn't have the courage to act on those things. And the truth was that Bert Charles was a blessing to me. He made life so miserable for me, I had to start looking at my life differently. I started going to work earlier. I started being the last one to leave there. I started working harder than anybody else. The other guys could not, why would you work so hard, Les? I said, I'm not working for them. I have been cheating, Bert, I thought. I've been cheating myself and my family, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, do it with everything that you have. Develop the habit of giving more than what you're paid for. Develop the habit of, of setting standards that others will be measured by. Someone said, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. <laughs> All right? It is easy to be negative today. It is easy to have low morale today. I was at a corporation and they're, they're going through downsizing and going to lay off some 1,500 people over the next few weeks. It's very depressing there. And those people that stay there nine times out of 10, they're just going to do just enough to keep from getting fired. Anybody can do that. But if you can begin to harness yourself and say that where I am, I'm going to do the best I can with what I got because that is an expression of who I am. If you get into the habit of just being mediocre, it will become a part of your consciousness. If you get in the habit of giving less than what you have it within you to give, it will begin to reflect itself in your personality. It will begin to damage you psychologically. And you don't want to be a part of that kind of self-destructive behavior. And so you want to set some high standards for yourself. The next thing, part of what feeds that hunger, you've got to develop a sense of urgency. Aurelia said, stop living your life like you have a thousand years to live. In life, you're either here today and you're gone today. If there's something that you want to do and you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. I like what Robert Shuler says. He said, by the yard, it's hard, but inch by inch, anything is essential. <laughs> do just a little bit of it. A friend of mine, Bobby Kerr, used to be a roommate. Bobby wanted to go into the area of public relations. He loved working with the public. Young lady he wanted to marry named Clarice. Bobby was a great procrastinator. Pretty soon the job where Bobby worked, they transferred him to another location. He went out to celebrate with the people on that new job site. And Bobby suffered a massive heart attack and died. Bobby didn't drink and didn't smoke, was under 40, and he died. 
ask you a question. How much time do you have left? How much time do you have left? When you start thinking about that, we don't know. We don't know. Bobby took all the greatness and all of the talent and all of his abilities to his grave with him. One of the things he could have put in parenthesis under his name, he didn't use all his stuff. And most of, most of us do that. Most of us don't use the stuff that we have brought into the universe. And we want to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to start living life with a sense of urgency and using what we've got. Using ourselves up. Sharing what we brought into the universe to share. Because if we don't, nobody else will. Stop wasting valuable time. Knowing that if we begin to live our lives as if each day were our last, our lives will take, a, take on a whole new meaning. It take on a whole new expression. Valuing each moment that we are blessed with. The next thing that begins to nurture that hunger, honor yourself as your word. Don't give your word out lightly. When you throw your word out there and you don't honor it, it makes a statement about you. If you decide to maintain a sense of integrity with yourself, that if I speak it, I'm going to live it. It's who I am. And I'm going to be very cautious in how I give my word to others and most of all with the commitments that I make to myself because I want my life to reflect my words and honoring who I am and what I express. Another challenging area in terms of nurturing and developing that hunger in yourself is learning the art of becoming single-minded. Learning how to concentrate. Learning how to focus in. And you'll be surprised of the things that you're able to do. When you learn how to block things out, when you learn how to keep thine eyes single, you'll be surprised of the ideas that will come to you, of the people that you'll be able to attract, of the opportunities that you'll be able to see. You'll begin to see things that have been standing there looking you in the face saying, I can't believe this has been here all this time. Here's a habit that I do. Maybe it might be of some value to you. I get up in the morning and I start writing what great ideas that I can think of today that can improve me and that will enable me to reach my goal. And I just let my mind flow. Sometimes I write 15, 20 ideas. Some days it's more difficult than others. One idea can change your life. One idea can turn your life around. Deciding that you're going to focus to develop your skills. A guy was, was um, the new owner of a team. A team, a baseball team that was in the basement of the league when he took it over. He went to the pitcher and he said, what is your best throw? And he said, well, I got a good curveball and I've got a good fastball. And he went on talking about his different throws. He said, but tell me this, what is your best throw? He thought for a moment. He said, I've got a good fastball. He said, that's all I want you to work on. Nothing else. Just develop your fastball. The next year, they went to the World Series. Most people don't know where their fastball is. Most people go through life never discovering what their talents are. Most people never develop their talents. They have skills and abilities, but if you don't nurture them, if you don't develop them, they will never serve you. Your gifts can take you many places if you develop your gifts. Most of us don't like to do those things that come easy to us. I've always loved to talk to people. I decided taking this advice to develop my skills as a speaker and my gift has developed and it developed and has taken me many places. You have something that you brought to the universe and that if you decide that my life deserves my developing this what I do well and becoming the best at it and mastering myself and seeing what I have within me, if you decide to drop your buckets where you are and develop your gifts, I grant you, you'll never ever be without. 
I grant you that your gifts will take you places that will literally amaze you. I grant you that if you begin to work to develop your gifts, you'll develop a strong sense of happiness. You'll get a larger vision of yourself because part of beginning to get a larger vision of yourself, all of us need some area of our lives where we can have a feeling of competence. That people know when they think about this area, that's something you do. That you eat and sleep that. And that you do that. You do that. And people know it. And you know it. And you know that you know that you know this. If you don't know anything else, you know this. Can you tell I know I know what I'm doing? Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> you know this. So you've got to work on it. When other folk are having a good time, you've got to have the, the strength of character to concentrate, to read, to digest information. If you decide in any particular area that you're concerned about to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to read one book a month in that area, in five years, you'll be among the top 5% experts in the world. I read a minimum of two books a week. The average American reads only one book a year. If you decide that area that you love, that you are going to master that particular area, in this era of accelerated change, overwhelming complexity and tremendous competition, as you begin to develop and expand your skills and your talents and your vision of yourself, you will always be in control of your destiny. The next thing is, whatever it is that you want to do, you want to do it massively. I have a friend who was telling me that his sales were down. I said, well, how many phone calls you make a day? He said, 25. I said, double them. Make 50 or 75 or 100. He said, oh man, that's just too much. Said, what do you mean too much? You behind on your bills? You're talking about too much? You know one way to get back on your feet real quick is to miss two car payments? <laughs> you're talking about you're tired? There's no competition out here. Decide that you're going to push yourself. Most people won't do that. Most people give up on themselves easily. You know the human spirit is powerful? There's nothing as powerful. It's hard to kill the human spirit. They asked Benjamin Disraeli, a man who became the head of a country at a time when Jews were not allowed out after 10 o'clock. They said, how did you do it? How did you achieve against such great odds? He said, nothing can resist the will of a people that will stake even their existence on the extent of their purpose for good. That when you have a made up mind when you decide that you want to do something, I was reading something the other day. He said, the power to hold on in spite of everything, the power to endure, this is the winner's quality. The hunger, the ability to face defeat again and again without giving up. This is a winner's quality. You have that quality within you. When you're hungry, you don't care about the facts. You don't care about the odds. Doug Williams played for the Washington Redskins, quarterback. John Elway of the Denver Broncos in the Super Bowl. Everybody was talking about Elway, Elway. After the Super Bowl, when Doug Williams made a historic passing game, they asked him, said, how were you able, in spite of all of the negative publicity saying that you couldn't win, how did, how did you do it? He said, I ignored my critics. I just didn't pay any attention to them. I ignored myself because they kept on saying it so much. There were times I doubted whether or not I can do what I needed to do. There's a Doug Williams in everybody here. There's greatness in you. And you've got to learn how to tune out the critics outside and the critic inside. And since I'm going to do this, I'm going to harness my will. And I'm not going to let anything stop me. I deserve this. I'm going to do it until... And this friend, I told him, said, start increasing your calls. I said, I make a hundred calls a day. I got a callus in my ear. My ear kind of dark, you can't see it, but it's there. <laughs> 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 he 
his sales have increased. <laughs> He's working harder now. The other thing is that if you want something, you have got to be relentless. You've got to learn how to become resourceful. You've got to learn how to become creative. When crises strike in your life, and in the Chinese language, crises mean danger, but it also means opportunity. And this is an opportunity for you to grow. And you've got to be so relentless, regardless of what comes down the pike, that you're always looking for a way to get over, always looking for a way that you can break through, always looking for a way that you can win, always looking for a way that you can strike a telling blow. And pretty soon, I think there's some people watching us in the universe that say, wait, let's call a meeting over here. You know that guy Mustafa, look at him down there. He won't stop, just that fool don't know he can't get over. Look, look, look. <laughs> Look, look here, why don't we do this? Let him go and let's make, mess with somebody else. Just let him go on through. Life will just get tired of whipping you sometimes. And just say, let's just let this one go. <laughs> I believe this. Now, no one has told me this, but I just kept on kicking. I didn't have sense enough to stop. I was intelligently ignorant. I didn't know what I couldn't do. <laughs> so I just tried anything. And the fascinating thing about life, because you can't get out of it alive, you might as well have a good time, you know? <laughs> you might as well have a good time. Live your life with passion, with some drive. I was giving a seminar the other day and I mentioned that I was going to do some training in August with some young teenagers and take about a hundred away to a two or three day camp and wipe them out. Been working on this. So after the speech, one of the parents walked up to me and said, Mr. Brown, I, I'd like for you to do something for my son. He's not motivated. <laughs> I said, I wonder why. I wonder what's wrong with him. <laughs> he had no fire whatsoever. <laughs> See, what, <laughs> what you do speak so loudly, folk can't hear what you're saying. And so if you don't have any fire, you know, you've got to watch the, the people, the relationships that you develop. Have people of, of, of kindred mindsets. If you're around folk who are dead and negative all the time, they will affect you. You want people that are around you that have smiles on their faces, looking good. I was telling a group last week, Abraham Lincoln refused to hire a guy because of his face. They said, but the guy can't help it. He said, anybody over 30 is responsible for their face. <laughs> if you have some depressing face looking at you every day, it affects your blood pressure. Keep these dead faces away from you. It's contagious. <laughs> this is serious. So you've got to watch your countenance. Watch your face. Have an uplifted expression. Watch your body posture. All of these things affect you psychically. You've got to be the kind of person that you are fearless. Fearless. Folk leave fearless people alone. <laughs> there are some people walk through a neighborhood and every dog in the neighborhood would bark at them. <laughs> but there are some people come through and ain't nobody gonna mess with this. <laughs> <laughs> You are unstoppable. And because you are unstoppable, because you've got power that you haven't even begun to use yet, you owe it to yourself to release your brakes. How many of you have had the experience of pulling out of your driveway and you're mashed on the accelerator and the car was just going, uh, and couldn't move, and you mashed harder and it couldn't move, and then you discovered you had your emergency brakes on? 
And then you release those emergency brakes and it goes, choo! Have you ever had that experience before? Most of us go through life with our brakes on, holding back, not giving all that we have, not sharing all of ourselves. Most of us go to our grave still holding on rather than releasing it. What are some of those things that, that keep us from releasing it? Because of past experiences, past defeats, past pain. We look back, well, it didn't work out then. It probably won't work out now. <laughs> Many people get confused their performances with who they are. They are. I was reading Pat Riley, the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. <laughs> But you're going to like this quote here. <laughs> After the trailblazers had blown them out of the water, and I'm sure he said this last night, they asked him, how do you feel? He said, tonight we were exposed for what we are right now. You see? That if my speech tonight doesn't work, it doesn't mean that I'm a bad speaker. It means that what I did didn't work tonight. And I've got to separate what I do from who I am. And I've got another shot. See, the last chapter to your life has not been written yet. And it doesn't matter about what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter about the things that you've done that you feel guilty about. If you wouldn't do it today, you're convicting an innocent person. You've been reborn to a new state of consciousness. And as they say, if we knew better, we would do better. And so you begin to decide, I'm not going to be denied. I remember and I was telling someone and they asked me, would you repeat that again? I was interested in going into broadcasting. I'm adopted. And that was my key out. I wanted to make my mama proud of me. I was, a pr I was very much appreciative of what she's done for my brother and sister and I. And that was my way out. And I went over to a radio station, asked a guy that, and told him that I was interested in broadcasting. He looked at me in my straw hat and my overalls. He said, you have any broadcasting background? I said, no, sir, I don't. What do you do? I cut grass. <laughs> Young ladies asked me what kind of work I do, and I was working on a garbage truck. I said, well, I'm a sanitary technician. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we don't have any job for you. I decided that that was something I was going to do. I decided I'm unstoppable. I'm going to go up and hit. I'm going to do this. I started going to the radio station every day, developing a relationship with the people that were doing what I wanted to do. And that's what I encourage you to do. Where, whatever area you want to go and find people that are doing it the way you want to do it and develop a relationship with them. When I decided to go in this area, I wrote letters to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, to Zig Ziglar, to Dennis Waitley, all of the giants in this area. And I said, this is something I want to do. I've been following your career. Would you help me? Dr. Norman Vincent Peale answered my letter, did an article on me, wrote about me in the most recent book that he issued, and done many broadcasts about me. I'd wanted to develop a relationship and rapport with those people that were achieving those things that I wanted to achieve. By the same token, I would go to the radio station, and I developed a relationship with the guys. And they used me as an errand boy when they needed some food or someone to go pick up the entertainers that came into town. Temptation singing, My Girl, Jerry Butler singing, For Your Precious Love, Sam Cooke singing, Darling, You Send Me. I would pick up the entertainers at the airport and drive them around in the disc jockeys, big Cadillacs. They didn't have any driver's license, but I was acting like I had some. <laughs> Every day I used to go home and work on my communication skills, developing myself. It was Whitney Young, he said, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. <laughs> Start working and developing yourself now and prepare yourself for what it is that you want because you expect to get it. And when the disc jockeys were in the control room, I would go in and watch them and develop a trust level and they would let me stay and I would watch and observe them working the controls. When you want something out of life, don't worry about how you're going to get it. How is none of your business. The most difficult thing that it is, is to hold the vision. It's to hold the vision. So there I was at the radio station. A guy was on the air and he started to drink by the name of Rock. I was outside the window looking at him and watching. <laughs> Hungry. <laughs> and ready saying, drink, rock, drink. 
Pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager. I said, hello. He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. He's slurring his words. I said, I know. Can you work the controls until one of the other disc jockeys come in? Would you call them? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be thinking I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn up the radio. I'm about to come on the air. I waited about 15 minutes. I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, well, why don't you go in there and work the controls until they get there? And don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to sit down at that turntable, Mustafa. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and indubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you've got to be hungry. <laughs> well, y'all something else, you hear me? <laughs> you want to be persistent about what it is that you want to achieve. Alexander Graham Bell said, what this power is, I cannot say. All I know is that it exists and it becomes available only when a man or a woman is in that state of mind in which he or she knows exactly what he or she wants and is fully determined not to quit until they find it. When our children are learning how to walk, how many times will your baby attempt to walk and fall and you just say, just sit down, don't try anymore, you've fallen 20 times. <laughs> Just sit down somewhere, busting your lip and everything, getting in folks' way. When will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. That's when it will walk. Les, when will you be known nationally as the motivator? I will be known when I'm known. That's when I'll be known. Don't get caught up in, well, I've tried it four or five times and things didn't work out. If there's something that you want and you're hungry for it, you've got to do whatever is necessary until. And when you give the best you can and that's not enough, you must do what is required. And don't give up on yourself. Don't throw the towel in so quickly. Many people give up on the one yard line where if they had the determination just to keep on knocking. It's a funny thing about life. If you're home one day, and someone is knocking on the door and you say, I don't want to be bothered today. And if that person just keep on knocking, can you believe that fool's still knocking? <laughs> Pretty soon you say, what is it? What do you want? And that's how you've got to be about your dream. Some people, well, I guess ain't nobody home. <laughs> I knocked on the door, but nobody came. I heard the television on and people were moving around, but I guess opportunity probably went out the back door. Oh, no, no, no. See, life is not just that simple. It's not that cut and dry. And that's why most people never realize their personal greatness because they're casual about life. And when you are casual about life, you will end up a casualty. <laughs> life is serious business. So I encourage you to be persistent to not decide that, well, I've done the best I can. I guess I, I just can't have it. Don't make that decision. Many of us make premature decisions about ourselves. Calvin Coolidge said something, a man who was a president that was not known for his eloquence or making any historical decisions, but something he wrote about persistence. And he says, press on. Nothing can take the place of persistence.